Reverend Ryan Chandler, author of the church village. Greetings all in the matchless name of the Son of God and Savior of the world, Jesus, who is the Christ. It's an honor and a privilege to be standing before you. You can't let just anyone stand before your sheep. Not everyone that went out in the name of Jesus was set by him. And, uh, the most dangerous kind of wolves are the ones that are wrapped in sheepskin. So I'm humbled and honored to be trusted in this spot. I believe the house has already been addressed, but uh, giving honor to all those to whom honors do. In light of the fact that we got limited time, we're going to get straight to the word here. Right. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. The secular world is constantly referring to life as a journey. How many of you all have heard the atheistic philosopher, the heathen entertainer, talking about life's a journey, not a destination? The Christian rejects this as a meaningless cliche because we know that life's not a journey, it's actually a pilgrimage. And on this pilgrimage, we travel a road that can be characterized as a transformation caused by the renewing of our mind. Your transformation is not going to be completed on this side of the grave. I'm going to say that again because there's a lot of Christians that don't know it. On this side of the grave, you're not going to be perfected while you're living. I've met some Christians and they, they think that their transformation is done. They think the renewal of their mind is some past tense completed event that took place a long time ago. Back when I fell on the floor at the tent revival in 1983, that's when my mind was transformed. You listen to some of these people describe themselves, you think they walk on water, eat bullets, and save babies from burning buildings all day long, that's all they do. But truth be told, their lives outside of the church are just as messed up as ours. Even more usually because they're living in a state of denial and all day long and self-deception. But our transformation is not instant, it's ongoing. So when you mess up, you don't have to beat yourself up. It's not going to come to its full completion until Jesus Christ comes, gets you up out of the grave and finishes it off himself. Even though we're not going to see the end result immediately, that doesn't mean that we can't see some evidence of the fact that it's in progress, that it started. The genuine Christian at some point is going to give off visible and identifiable fruit of a walk with God. If I throw an apple seed into the ground and nothing happens, eventually what question comes to your mind? Whether or not you even planted the seed at all. But if I throw an apple seed into the ground and it grows a palm tree with coconuts, you'd say something out of whack is happening under the surface there. Because a Christian's transformation takes place on the inside, the only way that we, who are the church, or even the world on the outside can see it is by what? By the fruit. One of the outward evidences that a person has been born again is an attitude of kindness. And you all know what kindness is. It's doing for people, it's talking to them right, it's helping them out, it's relieving their suffering. I don't have to go into too deep a detail. You guys got the Holy Spirit inside of you. You know what kindness sounds like, you know what it looks like. It's a rubber band that can be stretched to encompass, to include a lot of things, a lot of good that you need to be doing for your neighbor. And even those that you would call your enemy, or that they would call you their enemy. I'm just going to share two quick things about that kindness, then I'm going to get out of here. First of all, your kindness needs to be motivated by God and not man. And second of all, your kindness needs to be the result of your salvation, not the requirement of it. I'm going to break these two things down here. First of all, your kindness must be motivated by God and not man. The condition that we fell into in Adam, and how many of you all are descendants of Adam here? Every human being has to say it, no matter what we look like, no matter what kind of shoes we got on, where we work at, where we live at, we all descend from Adam and we all inherited the same condition. It left us messed up. Genesis 6-5 tells us that the wickedness of humankind is great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of our hearts only evil continually. Genesis 8-21 lets us know that the intent of our heart is evil from our youth. Jeremiah 17.9 makes us aware of the fact that our hearts are more deceitful than all else. And it's desperately sick. Deceitful means it can lie to us. Our hearts are lying to us all the time. You know, see people that get led around by their heart. Your heart can lie to you. It's not a safe guide. Jesus Christ himself in Matthew 15.19 said that out of our hearts come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, 
false witness and slanders. Romans 1.21 tells us that humankind's foolish hearts were darkened. Now, we're in such rough shape that Proverbs 28, verse 26 warns us that he who trusts in his own heart is a fool. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, our minds have been blinded. Proverbs 3.5, dangerous to lean on our own understanding. So you can see, daddy's eyes and mama's nose aren't the only thing we inherited at birth. We inherited a depravity that's resulted in a total inability to do a good work with right motives. Every time we try to show some kindness and we do it apart from the prompting of the Holy Spirit, where does that so-called kindness come from? It comes out of the heart of a wicked and rebellious creature. You're not going to hear that on TVN, but it's the biblical truth. An unbeliever performs what he calls acts of kindness. You hear him brag about it all the time on the job. We did some volunteer work this weekend. That that's why they do it, so they can tell you about it at the, at the water cooler. You see, the, the motive isn't to please God. It isn't to serve and glorify the king. And so you've got to hit them with the question, who are they trying to please? Who are they trying to serve? Who are they trying to glorify? If not God, then who? Man. An unbeliever can donate to charity. I see him do it all the time. A non-Christian can perform volunteer hours in the community. They can help another person out. But the thing that energizes them, that moves them, that helps them roll out of bed, it's a human motive. It's not a godly motive. Yeah. It's so that they can put it on their resume. Or so they can brag about it. I do such and such a thing in the community for this organization, for this group of people. So they can get honor and praise and have other people say, wow, you're great. And so the person that they help out is going to be in a position to owe them a favor. Or so they can get next to a girl. Oh, isn't he sweet? Or so they can enhance and further their reputation and trick the community into thinking they're a better person than they really are. Or for their real heathen so that good karma can come back to them. So they can, they can feel good about themselves and have self-esteem. I'm a great person because I help people look themselves in the mirror. So they can serve some heathen, pagan concept of God. Non-Christian religions do work all the time. It's not motivated by the God that created the universe. Who's it motivated? The scripture says demons. Demons motivate kindness. All kindness that is not motivated by God comes out of the depravity and the apostasy of the fallen human heart. And that's not real kindness. It's fake. It's a fraud. It's counterfeit. And I'm glad that the speaker on love acknowledged the existence of counterfeit love. Because that can be applied across the board. There's counterfeit fruits. As the scriptures say, people that function like this have received their reward in full. So I'm here to tell you today, let your kindness be motivated by God. Let your kindness be the fruit of a relationship with God. Let it come from a transformed person that got transformed or is in the process of being transformed by the renewal of their mind. Number two, your kindness must be the result of your salvation, not the requirement of it. I'm glad we have the courage to bring denominations together so long as it's around the truth and not despite the truth. Unity that looks the other way when some other denomination preaches evil is not unity in the biblical sense. It's evil. But we have real unity here because Jesus Christ is who we trust in. And that's a bond that's stronger than any force that can dare to separate the Christian church. Doesn't matter what we look like. Doesn't matter where we... Everyone's different up here. We all come together. Some so-called denominations have it backwards. Instead of kindness being the fruit of your salvation, they have your salvation being the fruit of your kindness. You, by definition, entered into a works-orientated salvation. At that point, it's a very dangerous spot to be in. How many times have you talked to another professing saint and they told you, I'm just trying to get to heaven. You're trying to get to heaven? I already told you from Scripture what we became after the fall. Do you think the person that fell into this shape is going to succeed when they're trying to get to heaven? Hell is full of folks that thought they could do it. But if we could get to heaven on our own, as Galatians 2 says, Jesus Christ came to earth on a fool's errand. Why shed the blood of God the Son if we're able to get to heaven on our own power? Salvation is not of man because man's heart is too sick to achieve it. Salvation is of the Lord. It's not wages. It's not payment for any services that we've rendered to God as though we did anything. It's a gift that He gave us that we didn't deserve. After He saves you, then for the first time, the Holy Spirit puts you into a condition in which you're now capable of real kindness. Not kindness as the world has described it, as they defined it, but as God sees it. You're not saved because of the fact that you're kind, but rather you're kind because of the fact that you're saved. 
Kindness is not the cause of your salvation, it is the effect of your salvation. You ever took one of them IQ tests and they say, put the pictures in the order that they happened in. Don't mess up this order, you're going to be in hell. Hell's not popular, but guess what? We preached it for 2,000 years. In closing, brothers and sisters, we ought to be saved by the kind of faith that produces kindness. It's not going to look the same in everybody. Don't look at your brother saying, you think you're a Christian. Your behavior doesn't conform to my prejudices and my presuppositions of what I think you should be doing. It's not going to look the same in everybody. I get tired of hearing Christians beat each other up. You think you're a Christian and you didn't do this. You stepped on my pinky toe or you watched football or you listened to the, to the Jacksons or whatever. Shut up. It's not going to look the same in everyone and it's not going to show up in your time frame when you think it should, but it's got to show up at some point. If God so lays it on your heart, maybe I'll come back and we'll go deeper into this. But uh, I appreciate you having me. May God bless and keep you and your families. I do bear witness that there is but one God, eternally existing simultaneously as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Jesus Christ is the only Savior, and the Bible is the only guide for a lost and erring human race. Turning it back over to the next people.